welcome to this lecture that I held during Atlantia's Kingdom University. Before we start, let me just remind you to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of my other videos and to hit like if you like this or by all means hit the thumbs down if you don't. You can also find all my other videos about folklore under the playlist Scandinavian Folklore here on my channel. Except for this, I want to highlight my Patreon page if you want to support me. Or you can buy me a cup of coffee on ko-fi.com. All the links are in the description down below. Oh, and I didn't realize I forgot to cover the window behind me, so I've tried to include as many videos and picture clips as possible to make this a little bit better to watch. So, with that out of the way, let's begin. When we are talking about folklore, uh, folklore beings, pre-Christian era, we are talking about religion. So what do we know about Iron Age religion? Let's start there. We do not know much. It's a bit of a puzzle because there are not that many sources. So what we do have are picture stones, rune stones, archaeology findings, and a very few written texts. The problem with those were written texts is often that they are not written by the Norse people themselves. So uh, sometimes they are written after the actual Iron Age period. So uh, we have the Icelandic sagas when it comes to that. We do have written texts from the, the period that we call the Viking Age. But the problem there is that they are not written by the Norse themselves so often. So they are usually written by other people from other cultures or Christian people. And Christian people did not want to portray this in a very good way, usually. I mean, they were trying to Christianize Scandinavia. So that meant they wanted to portray the old habits as sort of bad. In the other ones, we have Roman texts and we have uh, Muslim texts. What, what we do know about that is that, well, they were, of course, colored from their faith, their culture. And sometimes they might not understand what they were seeing. We can also include a language barrier here. I mean, the Vikings traveled. We know that. They traveled far. We have uh, a Muslim uh, from Constantinople that describes the Vikings, but we, we can't really <laughs> claim that he understood their language. We couldn't actually talk with him, he more, more observing. And if I try to put myself in, in a situation where I have no knowledge of the Christian faith and I am watching a Catholic mass, if you try to, if you try to put yourself in those shoes, what would you see? And what would you experience? Would you understand completely what was happening and be able to describe it? N not likely. Some, of, uh, some things you will pick up, you will be able to describe the cross and the crucifix and, and so on. But will you understand what that was? No, it's a rather strange things that's going on there. So this is important to know when we are talking about old historical texts, we need to understand who wrote them and why. And with what eyes did they view upon the people they were describing? And then we have another thing that we need to think about when it comes to, when we're talking about old religion from a culture where we don't have very much text from, from their own, and that is our, our own modern views of things. It's hard to step out of that. And that means that very many people look at history with sort of a modern pair of glasses. And we like to think that the Iron Age religion, the pre-Christian religion up in Scandinavia, was this unified uh, clergy, uh, unified common way of practice. And this is probably not what, how it was. From the sources that we do have and what we can puzzle together it seems, I mean, we do know that for, for once, the Vikings were not just one people. They were several different groups, clans, uh, small villages, and 
they were very far apart sometimes. We didn't have any proper roads. We for sure did not have a postal office, internet and telephones. So that means that communication between areas, they were random at best. So again, that there we have a lot, sort of people tend to have their own little cultures. The Viking Age is not like this unified group of people that did everything the same way. And we'll see this later on in history too. I mean, it's it didn't just magically change because we got, got Christianed. And also this meant that people were kind of lonely and, and vulnerable out there in the villages. The gods were there to protect them, but those beings were not the closest. The closest thing and was, that was dangerous was nature. So this is where folklore actually comes in. We can see it a little bit like the gods and the big blood, uh, blood, uh, blood sacrifice that has been described from a town called Uppsala in Sweden. Well, that was something that happened a few times a year. And it was very much for the upper class and the warriors. So if you look at the common people and more of their daily way of being a religious person, they seem to offer to the invisibles and the invisible people. And that is what in Norse is called vettir. And vettir was a large group of beings who lived, they lived in the forest, um, under the floor of the barn, in a tree stump in the yard. And the Swedish modern word for it is rådare. Uh, rådare means somebody that rules over something. And this is what the these sort of land spirits uh, did. They ruled over their domain. And here we find beings like tomten, vettar, skogsrå. I'm going to I'm going to go through all these later. And we know very little about this being pre-Christian era. We just know that, okay, it seems like this were the thing that the common people did more, more of a daily religious basis. You put out all little offerings to your invisible neighbors to keep the neighborhood peace. And then Christianity came and things changed, but not that much, not to the start. We can see that the belief in these invisible people, the, the land spirits uh, and the trickster spirits of nature, they was very, very strong. And that is because the church had a huge problem at stop making us sacrifice to them. The clergy in the church had a really hard time with this. And this is also a thing that changes from when we have the Iron Age religion. Everything there was very much more a gray zone. And then suddenly the Christian church came and the medieval Christian church was very black and white. You had God on the other side that was good and the rest sort of fall under the devil. So of course, since these beings were not from God, this was not a Christian thing, they were put under the devil and hence being judged at the devil's henchmen and, and, and the devil's beings. And of course the church condemned putting out food and, and offerings to these beings because for, for the church, this was a sort of idolatry. So we can see the early period of Christian Scandinavia, how the church is sort of brushing things off a little bit. It's like, oh, okay, they are doing this. This is not good, but hey, uh, they will probably stop when they understand the glorious thing of the Christian church. And then they see that, no, people are not stopping doing this. We need to sort of put an effort in this. And here we can really see history. This is a good way, if, if you're studying history, to see what the church and the power, um, like the king or whoever, the rulers, to see what they are trying to make people stop doing is a really good way of see what people actually were doing. Because they wouldn't put an effort in just one or two people did this, that, that would not be a problem, but they will just handle these people. But if it's a common thing to do, that's when laws comes up, that's when you, you can see that they are really trying to change people as, as, as a whole. So what did they do then? Okay, people are not stopped doing this. We need to make sure that people know that 
this is bad, this is the devil thing. And here is where we can see actual laws coming up. We can see people are being condemned for having to do with these creatures. And this is as late as 14th century. And then of course we have the huge uh, witch trials during 17th century, which is much later. But during 14th century, we still have one or two examples of where people actually have been condemned for having usually sex with, with these beings or offering to them and sort of gaining things from them. Uh, so this was called magic and witchcraft and heresy. But why did, didn't people stop doing this? Well, this was a sort of a security blanket. People had done this for generations and generations, offerings to the invisible people. The invisible people was something that for the people of Scandinavia was a very real thing. And by offering you peace, then you kept the, the neighborly uh, balance and it of course felt safe better the devil you know than the devil you don't you don't right i see this a little bit like you can see a lot of other cultures where you change religion it doesn't matter if it's a buddhism or or hinduism or muslim or christianity when a, one of these bigger religion comes and change the way of how people live and how people do their daily religious worship these little things, the little folklore beings, those are the one that kind of stays because they are, they are such a natural way of how people live. I thought I were going to continue with a little bit of why do people continue to tell folk tales and folklore? Well, first off, entertainment. People have always entertained others by telling stories. And then you have the ones that are warning people, you're warning people about dangers, also explaining them. And here we're talking things like drowning, disappearing in the woods, etc. And then also explain sickness, mental health issues, all these things that people didn't understand back then, that they didn't have knowledge of. You have folklore that explains nature, particularly strange things that you find in nature that you don't understand. There we have actually the old picture stones and the rune stones that you find. Here up in, in Sweden, the most of the Scandinavian countries actually, you kind of find leftover rune stones, picture stones, basically everywhere. And they, they are there and they are in the middle of the forest. And during the medieval times and the Renaissance times, people have forgotten about what they were. The, the common people. So archaeological objects, that was a hard word, are often used as magical ob objects and artifacts. And folklore is a way to explain what this is. We have something that calls Thor's Viggar, Thor's flashes. Vig is an old, old Scandinavian word for flash. These are actually stone age axes that people have found in their, uh, in their fields. And they didn't understand what this was. This was a very strange formed rock and you can find several of them. So how they explained it is that, ah, of course, Thor has come here hunting trolls and the flashes has hit, hit the trolls and turned into stone. And this is what I find in my field. We have rock carvings, what we today call cup marks or ring marks. But in Scandinavian folklore, they are called fairy pits or fairy mills. Again, people back then didn't understand what this was. So it looked a little bit like a tiny hole for a mill. So of course the fairies had been there and, and grind their flour. So this, this goes on and on. And we, we still use those words very much up in Scandinavia still today. It's, it, even if we, of course, today don't necessarily believe that there are fairies, that we kind of have learned uh, other things about it now, but we still use the words for it. I also thought I was going to, to mention a little bit about the folklore magic. If you thought that African cultures and Caribbean cultures are the only one with voodoo dolls, you're wrong. That is something that you find in very many different cultures. And so also the old Norse cultures. Having 
a piece of hair or some blood spit or a nail or some piece of nail or something from a person gives you power over that person. So they made little wooden or other other material you can carve from, little wooden statues, and then they attached this. And I can't say that they did this during Viking Age because we have no knowledge of this. I do know that they did this during medieval times and they have continued to do this up until modern days. So would it all, not just African or Caribbean, it's actually also Norse or Scandinavian. And last, before I go into the beings, I thought I will mention one being that I don't have planned to mention it. But when I started to, to plan this lecture, I was like, oh, right. Yeah. Uh, werewolves. Again, something that you find in basically all cultures uh, around the world. A lot of the folklore magic is something that you will find in one way or another around the world. And werewolves is one of them. We have were coyotes. We have were llamas from Chile. In many African cultures, we have lions and, and panthers. Indian has snakes and tigers. And um, uh, the Inuit people have both wolves and polar bears. So it seems like you're taking some kind of animal that you apply magical abilities to and that is the animal that people also can be turned into the difference between the sort of i would i want i don't want to say modern but it has sort of become a modern way of, of how to be a werewolf is that in scandinavian folklore during the medieval times you did not become werewolf by being bitten you became werewolf by being cursed and you broke that curse by mentioning the person's name. In Scandinavia, and we are talking, not talking Iceland and Denmark, we are talking Finland, Norway, and Sweden. We have treated our, one of, of our people up there very badly, and that is the Samic people. We have basically done to the Samic people the same that the, the US did to the Native Americans, trying to wipe out their culture. And we also have a huge racism. And why do I mention this? Yes, because if you are reading about Scandinavian folklore, if you're reading folk tales, you will notice that the evil shaman, the evil sorcerer is always a Finn or a Sami bad word for Sami is lap and and that is not something that you use today no that that is bad that is a bad word but you will see this and and this is also a little bit like we see this in in many culture I mean we can we can talk about how racism here that is a long discussion and not something we should do here but I want to mention it because for people outside Scandinavia, if you are reading folk tales, you will you will see this. And if you don't know the background of it, uh, it, it can be a little bit like you you might you you might wonder about it and you might use it wrong. So uh, yeah, in Scandinavian folklore, you will see uh, Samic people and Finns turning up as bad people very often, and that is a sort of racism that were present and were kind of like natural back then. It's, it, it's, it doesn't excuse it. It's just that this is how things were. Hey, cat then. Okay, here comes the kitty. Uh, so that was all I had before going into the actual beings. So again, if you have questions, please ask them. I have a question. Yes. Where were the Sami people in relation to, you mentioned, you know, the, the, what you were working on, the Bronze Age folklore and myth and, and then the Viking Age. Well, where were the Sami people in that? How did yeah. the two people, were they two separate people that you're uh, trying? Yes, or? yes. Uh, the, the, what we called Vikings, that people and the Sami people are two different kind of people. They did have a, a lot of trading and a lot of things to do with each other. So, so we, we do know that they met and they changed cultural things between each other. But the Samic people were much more nomadic people. They moved, they have uh, reindeers. So they move kind of with a herd. Vikings were more settlers. But the cultures between the Viking culture and the Samic cultures is not that different. So I don't think there was this huge racism back then and the, the viking did 
in no way trying to conquer the Samic in, in any way. This was like, okay, this is our neighbor and they have a lot of strange things they do and we don't always understand them, but hey, they, they gave us nice things. And then the Christian came and the Samic was very resilient to becoming Christians. The Vikings were more prone to become Christians. So that's also a little bit about why the Samic people turn into these black magic shaman bad people because they weren't Christian. They have their own religion. And that religion is not the Acer religion. That religion is, is the Samic religion. I sadly have to say, I don't know so much about it, but it's, um, it's also a lot about land spirits, about uh, they have, again, a battery of, of their own gods. I hope that answered your question. Yes, thank you. So here we're going to the different beings. And I mentioned Tomte. And uh, this is a little being that I think he is one of our most beloved beings. And also around Christmas, you will see, you will see this little being in Scandinavia showing up basically everywhere. And it's not Santa. He is one of these ruler beings that lived on the farm helping the farmer. So he is a sort of a protection spirit. You know, he will only do bad things if you disrespect him. Otherwise, he will help you. He does have a really bad temper. So you better stick to his rules or he will give you a smack or he could even, I mean, if you, if you treated him bad enough, he would burn down your barn. So keeping him in a good and happy spirit, very important. And people have loved him probably from Viking age to modern days. He is probably one of the oldest. He looks like a little old bearded man, small in stature, and he has simple gray and brown clothing, usually with a brown or a red cap. And you put out offerings for him. Later in time, it has become a very hard to find custom to put out a bowl of porridge for your tomte. And it's very good with cats and animals, uh, even though my cat seems to hate everything with, uh, with a tomte hat. Then we have what we call a sjöro. This is a Scandinavian. Okay, uh, John, you raised your hand. I was just curious, that the uh, tomte, are they uh, called anything else? They look familiar, but I'm not sure. Uh, the... they, they probably look very familiar with gnomes. Uh, that's probably it. Yeah, and gnomes is a different being from the tomte, but they are very, very similar. But gnomes is from sort of Germany, Middle European, but they are very similar. You will probably see similar creatures in the Scottish brownie. Let's move out. We have, I usually call them the three sisters, and this is a roa creature. Roa meaning ruler, so it's not something that is raw and uncooked. It's, it's R in an A uh, with a ring over. So... We have these three female, very strong, very powerful beings. One for the lake, one for the forest, and one for the mines and the mountains. The first one I was going to talk about is the sjö, roa. Sjö is lake in Swedish. So the Scandinavian mermaid. And some say that she could be a rest from the belief in Ran, which is an old Iron Age goddess of the sea. I say... Yeah, sure. I'm not saying she's not, but I also saying that people all around the world have had some kind of being a woman creature that has power over the sea or the lakes where there have been fishermen and seafarers. And they have had kind of the same kind of powers. So if she stems from Ran or if she stems from even an older beliefs, I I, I cannot say. All these three female beings live alone and they have a sort of the same things. They are both protection spirits and trickster spirits. So they can help you or they can hurt you. It's all a little bit depending on how you treat her. Uh, and they also warn people. So the mermaid is of course warning for, for storms and dangers. There is an idea that this uh, female being, because later in history, a male version shows up. And there is this idea that, yes, this is the patriarchy. This is the patriarchy doing things against the strong female characters. Meh, sure. 
Uh, it could be, but the tomte was a male spirit, very, very powerful male spirit, and he suddenly got a female version. So, and started getting family. So I'm not, I'm not sure if this is actually, I like to blame the patriarchy for most things. Uh, in this case, I do actually think that this is just a natural way when you are telling stories and then you are telling them, you heard them about another being, but you apply it to this being because this is what your audience would expect. So the Scandinavian folklore, kind of the beings kind of like get tangled up later on in history. And a good way to please the, mer the Scandinavian mermaid is to leave gloves for her or snooze, which is uh, like chewing tobacco uh, or booze. Most Scandinavian beings is perfectly fine with a cup of booze. I don't know if this says anything about our culture, but um, booze has been the thing for most beings to keep them nice. And then we have her sister, the mistress of the mountain, Gruvrå. And just like her sister in the lake, she lives alone, always a female, and also a protection spirit. She is much more a protection spirit than a trickster spirit, but she has tricks, uh, sort of um, trickster influences. Okay, so then we have the last sister, and that is the mistress of the forest. And you see the pattern here. She lives alone. She's a guardian and trickster spirits. And all of these three women's beings are usually very beautiful. They look like a beautiful woman. And then they have some kind of traits that make you discover them if they turn your back to them. So while the lake, mistress of the lake, she has like fish scales and is a hollow back. The gruvrå, the, the mistress of the mountain, she could actually look like a piece of rock when you turned uh, her back to you. And the mistress of the forest, the skogsrå, she usually looks like a rotten tree or she has a cow's tail or a fox tail. And you can see that the northern part of Sweden, she has a tail. And the southern part of Sweden, Sweden is a very long country. Uh, the southern part of Sweden, she ha has a hollow back. And in the middle, she has both. So there you can see how the stories kind of, they, they travel. And then here somewhere, she suddenly gets both. This Last sister, she has gotten a really bad reputation. She has been called the pinup girl of Scandinavian folklore. And yeah, she does love sex and she does love men, but she is so much more than just that. She, she can grant you good hunting fortune. She can take away your hunting fortune. She can make you go lost, completely lost and never find your way uh, back home again. And uh, she is not running around naked, as you see in very many 19th century portrays of her. She was actually usually very well dressed. She's dressed as a fancy woman. And one thing about her is that Odin hates her. I don't know why he hates her so much, but it is a fact that Odin and, and Thor, Thor, they turned from gods. They've been gods in the Viking age. And then they sort of transformed into being a folklore being, uh, like a, a, a vessel. They kept their names and they kept their traits. Odin is still one-eyed on a horse, two big wolves and ravens, uh, but he's no longer a particularly a god. He, he's more like on the same levels as the other invisible people. And this is a strange thing that I cannot explain, but it's a fact. And I think that's also how Odin and Thor has sort of lived on in Scandinavia for so long, even if it has been in another form. And here we comes to the being Vettar. And in the beginning, I was speaking about the, the oldest being that called Vettir, and that is Vettar or Vittra. It depends a little bit where you are in Scandinavia. But these have kept, these have sort of become their own being, separate from the other beings I'm talking about. But these ones have kept a lot of what the original invisible people had. They are invisible. They live side by side with people. They also belong to the lonely places where the women took cows up during the summer because they had cows. So they basically lived just like people, except that they were invisible and magic. They looked a bit like people do most. Sometimes they are smaller, 
sometimes they have some kind of trait that makes you wonder a little bit, but they were like people were most. Kept their livestock, washed their clothes, had babies. They can, uh, in the northern part of uh, Sweden and Norway, so ca- they can kidnap babies and have changelings. They can also take adult people and take them into the underground. So you needed to be safe from them. You needed rituals to be safe. There's uh, a habit that has also been described from early medieval age up to today. I know that my grandma did this still. And that is if you pour out something hot, they are living underground. So you don't want to to hurt them. So if you're pouring out some, something hot, you need to kind of proclaim like, oh, look up down there. And then you throw it. And then you know that, okay, you have warned them. So you didn't burn them. Trolls. Trolls is one of, another one of my favorite beings because they are so freaking chaotic. They, just like the Vettar, they live in families. They are like people are most... And they are a very diverse group. They can be butt ugly. They can be a stunning beauty. And they can be super small and normal human size or gigantic. In Norway, especially in northern Norway, trolls are usually thought of as very big. But in Sweden and Finland, they are more normal sized people. And I think in Denmark, they are considered small. They're always super strong. Uh, and they are shapeshifters. So you cannot know if it was a troll or if it was a black cat or even a post on a fence. Any, any object that behaved strangely could be a troll that had transformed into this object or this animal just to have a laugh, just to be chaotic and just, you know, I was bored. I had nothing else to do. So they are a little bit like cats in that way. Oh, I wonder what this do. Book. They are a scare monster as well as a trickster. Of course, you needed to avoid them. But there are stories that people lived next to them and sort of borrowed things from them. And they came and borrowed things from you. And oh, like, you know, good neighbors. And as long as you kept your deal with them, they were not dangerous. But if you did not, then they could go and do something really really, really bad. And these are also the ones that like to steal babies, changelings. And this is, of course, a way to sadly explain uh, mental health issues. Babies that has some kind of a development issue and so on. So this is a little bit of a tragic story if you look at it away from the the, the actual folklore. But it it was a way to explain that. We have fairies. Fairies or elvor or alfer. Elves. Uh, you can call them a lot of things. They are not, when you're calling them fairies or, or elves, they are not the little small uh, cute beings with wings. Fairies in Scandinavian folklore are mean. They are really evil and usually you don't actually see them. They are invisible. Again, we are going back to the invisible people. Uh, I see I have a question. Yes, they are very similar to, to the Irish. Yeah the one I can't pronounce right now. They live also, they are thought to live like underground and uh, they are invisible and they come up and you explain there is a fungus that grows in a ring. So if you look at a meadow, you can see like it's, it's, the grass has a other com- uh, color, a darker color in a ring shape. And that was thought to be where the fairies had danced. And if you peed in that ring or if you even enter that ring, you can become sick. Again, this is a way of explaining mental issues and also um, sexual transferring diseases, a lot of stuff like that. And you protected yourself with rituals, uh, like turning your sweater inside out is always a good thing. But if you had gotten the sickness, then you could offer in these fairy pits, the ring cup, the cup mark that I was talking about uh, earlier. And you put some fat or some booze or, or something in that. And that offering could help you get better and, and let them sort of take off the, the sickness. We also have a being called uh, Necken or Bekkehesten. These, these are the, the words that probably are very hard for non-Scandinavian people to pronounce. But Necken, Neck means naked. So this is the naked guy. 
And he hasn't always been naked. He has appeared dressed too. But the one thing with this guy is that he is a pure scare monster. He is the bad man waiting in some kind of moving water, like creek or um, stream. And he is sitting there playing music. From the beginning, it was a harp. You can find that in medieval ballads, where he is luring usually some poor dude or, or dudette down in the stream. And then he started playing the violin later on in history. Why he started playing the violin? Eh, maybe he got tired of the harp. Or it could also be that the violin was called the devil's harp in Swedish. So it is uh, probably some connection there because the violin very quickly became a popular instrument for the people. So the naked guy, he can also transform himself into a beautiful horse. And if you touch that horse, you will get stuck and then he will run down in the water with you. So he is like, do not pet beautiful horses at the shore of streams. Could be necken. You can learn how to play the violin from him too. And the last one. This is my pure favorite one. The evil pig. Glu Soon. Glu probably comes from like staring. And Soon, Su is a female pig in, in Swedish. So it's the evil, the evil staring female pig. Uh, and this was also a scare monster. And this is the one that came actually after the Viking Age. I don't think this actually stems from the Viking Age. Because this is a warning monster that if you, do ma if you dabble in magic, if you do something magic that you're not supposed to do, the Glusu will come and get you. And he will, uh, she, because it's always a female pig, she will run between your legs and cut you in, in half. So... There is some that says it's a connection to Sarim and Julenbosht, but it's very hard to prove because you have no mention of him until later in medieval times. I think the first time you can I have any kind of sources on him is from 16th century. So he's probably a later and he is probably created to scare people from doing uh, folklore magic. She was also, of course, most active during the magical nights like Midsummer, Christmas Eve, New Year's and such. So yeah, that was me. I have four minutes for questions. Yay me for talking so much. I'm gonna show you this as a start. This is made with a little bit of ha ha he he. I, I made this sort of just trying to uh, divide them. Like how do you divide these beings? So it's a little bit fun. You did very well. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> that is I have a question for you. Yes, please. So I had um, a visit to Norway in the last year, and I noticed that were there was like tons of um, very prolific amount of troll like statues outside of stores. Like it was like they were guarding the stores. Like they were they were always standing outside. They were very ugly. Usually big long noses with like white on the tip like it was bird poop um, yeah. i just was wondering a little bit more about that prevalence well um the the norwegian trolls has kind of become a tourist staple in in all the tourist shops and that is the northern part of the trolls so they are big they are ugly they usually have a lot of traits from the forest they can amass on them or you know a, a, a little tree growing from from their shoulder or stuff like that uh, and they are ugly so is there any like folklore history to them or have they just been completely appropriated for like tourism no no there, there is folklore stories told about them and they if, if you look at the trolls from like the viking age they, they are very diverse. The trolls are mentioned there. Thor hates trolls and he hunts trolls. And they are very diverse. Again, they can look like a normal being, but they can also be this huge giant. Trolls and giants in the Scandinavian folklore and also in the Iron Age religion are hard to separate. They are kind of like the same being in some way because they can look so different. They can be this huge giant guys uh, and they can also be small small guys like the ice giants in the Easter. yes well, exactly exactly so yeah there, there is folklore about them they they have been a little bit appropriated to tourists but there are still stories about them being like that 